So I do have to uh, just report some conflicts of interest. I do largely rely on federal funding uh, for the majority of my work, uh, but I also do some professional consulting, uh, but none of that is actually really that relevant or doesn't influence what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, some philosophical conflicts I do believe, and the reason why I'm here is that long-term brain health can be both simple and inexpensive to achieve. Um, and I don't believe that our brains uh, exist in silos, unlike most of modern neuroscience. So as an example, things that I am currently involved in, my day job is I direct the ne neonatal neuroscience laboratory at the University of Washington. We try and develop ways to treat the injured newborn brain. Uh, but at the same time, I'm also involved uh, with the Brainstorm Institute, uh, which is trying to increase brain resilience in athletes and some military groups who are basically destined to get traumatic brain injury. How do we reduce the impact of those? And then I'm also on the scientific advisory board of Food for the Brain, which is a charity that's provided uh, free cognitive testing for nearly half a million people now, and we're trying to develop lifestyle-based ways to mi mitigate or uh, prevent cognitive decline. And if you were trying to apply for money for these, each one would be considered completely separate, and there's no link between the neonatal brain and the, the declining brain or the injured brain in midlife, when in reality, you just have one brain, uh, and all of these things are, are important over time. So my unifying question, which I sort of uh, see uh, from day to day. So on the left, uh, you have uh, here, this is a, a baby born prematurely. Uh, this is a baby born at term that has some kind of acute injury at birth. Um, you know, tr how, how do I treat these brains? What do these brains need? Uh, then on the weekend, maybe I'm working with, with an athlete um, who's trying to maintain health uh, performance of both their body and brain. Um, and then maybe we might be thinking about somebody uh, who has Alzheimer's disease or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. That's the downstream effect of being hit in the head multiple times. You know, is there, are there things that, that all of these brains need that we can sort of unify, unifying hypothesis maybe if uh, Mickey was here. Um, so I came up with my, my three-legged stool uh, of what a brain needs, um, materials, security, and connection. Uh, over a lifetime, and the three-legged stool is, is a bit of a cliche, so this is my three-legged brain um, uh, of things that your brain needs uh, across uh, a lifetime, I think. Um, so as a case study, um, the, the examples that I'm going to use primarily come from premature infants. So those of you who don't know much about uh, being born prematurely, uh, this is recent data looking at uh, gestational age, so how long you managed to stay in utero before you were born um, and then rates of uh, both survival. So this is what we call the limit of viability currently around 22 weeks. That's just over half normal gestation. Um, and then as gestational age increases, survival increases, that's the blue here. Uh, but then say survival without any neurodevelopmental impairment uh, also increases. So down here, you know, it's very unlikely that if you do survive that you won't have some kind of developmental disability. Um, and what's interesting about the premature brain that is relevant even to cognitive decline is that when you're born prematurely, you have multiple insults, inflammatory, there are, uh, uh, often inflammation is associated with premature birth in the first place, oxidative stress, they're born into an environment that has a higher oxygen tension than they're used to, uh, nutritional issues, you no longer have the placenta providing your nutrition, so you often get things like intralipid uh, while you're in the NICU. Um, and then social things, so um, you are disconnected from the mother. There are some ways to improve that with kangaroo care, but lots of different things that then translate through, uh, through to increased risk throughout the entire life. So um, this uh, is something that actually goes back to uh, Kevin's talk earlier. If you look at babies born prematurely or adults who were born prematurely, if you look at how premature they were, they have an increase in how old their brain looks on an MRI scan. So they have accelerated brain aging that's directly proportional to how premature they were. And at the same time, uh, you see the same thing with how sick they were. So the sicker they were in the NICU, um, the older their brain looks then once they reached early adulthood. Then we see the same trajectory that continues throughout the entire lifespan. So this is data now on um, older people who have Alzheimer's disease, uh, progressive mild cognitive impairment, stable mild cognitive impairment or no impairment. And if you look at the rate of brain aging over time, so this is using MRI scans and a machine learning algorithm to sort of guess the age of the brain, then if you have Alzheimer's disease or progressive cognitive impairment, your brain is aging faster. Um, and this basically can start right at the beginning of your lifetime. And this then translates to uh, things that we really care about, like all-cause mortality. Um, and this is uh, data now, people getting into their 50s. So the first prematurely born babies could only really be kept alive 
when they invented uh, or improved ventilation in the 70s. So we're only now starting to see adults who were born very preterm uh, su uh, survive uh, this long. But you can essentially see the same thing both for men and women. Um, the younger you were, the more premature you were, so going up uh, here, basically the earlier you die or the, the, the more likely you are to die across your entire lifespan. And so this is essentially, uh, this slide basically should give you the entire takeaway uh, of, of my talk, which is the brain, your brain and your body is the product of the environment. And actually, if I look at this uh, graph really hard, it should uh, initiate a very uh, severe existential crisis because what it shows is that somebody who's developing um, neuroprotective agents for use in babies in the NICU in the hospital, it probably matters almost not at all compared to the environment that that baby goes home to. So um, what this uh, graph shows here um, is uh, the level of maternal education of a baby born prematurely. Um, so primary, secondary school, undergraduate, postgraduate degree. And if, that, if you look at the amount of injury that that baby's brain has in the hospital, then, and you predict what their uh, cognitive function is gonna be like at four years of age, you'll see that um, those, um, the prediction or the, the, those who, who have a, a lower level of uh, maternal education end up um, with a, a much lower um, or a much lower prediction uh, due to the injury. Uh, but if, you, if your mother has a postgraduate education, basically the brain injury that you have in hospital means nothing for your final, uh, final outcome. And the important thing is that basically maternal education is a proxy for a huge number of things. So, um, various aspects of socioeconomic status, uh, social determinants of health, so we know that exposure uh, to systemic racism and experience of racism actually increase the risk of prematurity in the first place, as well as affecting both neonatal and maternal health outcomes. Um, other things like uh, nutrition quality, education quality, um, all these other things can be boiled down basically into this, into this one thing. So depending on those things that your brain goes into, that's essentially gonna determine your brain for life. So I'll go through each of these legs one by one, uh, hopefully um, within time. Um, and my hypothesis that essentially informs a lot of this talk is that growing a brain and maintaining or repairing a brain will require similar substrates and processes, unlike uh, what most grant funding buddies would have you believe. Um, so this, I'm gonna briefly talk about ketones uh, just because I think they're interesting in this context. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have a picture of an experimental setup of an experiment that nobody would ever be able to do nowadays, but they took um, aborted fetuses um, and they took the brains and they infused them with glucose and ketones to see how much would be actively taken up. Um, and what you see here, beta hydroxybutyrate and glucose, on a molar um, equivalent, uh, probably at least 50%, if not twice as much ketones are being taken up by the developing brain uh, in utero than, than glucose. Um, and then this is a nice quote uh, from a paper that actually built on work that was really started by Hans Krebs uh, when he was at Oxford um, that's, that says uh, beta hydroxybutyrate was the preferred substrate for sterile and fatty acid biosynthesis in the three organs of ectodermal origin, the brain, spinal cord, and skin. So everybody talks about ketones being important for metabolism, but when you're trying to both maintain, grow, and repair a brain, actually they're the brain's preferred source of biosynthetic materials to make new uh, brain cells. Um, so then we'll talk about uh, fats. There's the other things that you need uh, to grow a brain. Um, and these are uh, data taken from um, autopsy studies uh, where the infants died of something not related to the brain. And they looked at the amount of fats that were in the brain relative to their gestational age. And I really like, like this study because they have gestational age in weeks. Um, and so this is time in utero and it goes up to like 150 weeks. That's three years uh, of pregnancy, which probably uh, most people wouldn't like, like to enjoy. Um, but it's, it's basically, uh, so it goes up to here, this is, this is in utero and then that's the next two years ex utero. But basically what you see is that DHA um, uptake increases in you know, the main sort of long chain omega-3, uh, arachidonic acid at, the set at a similar rate, uh, a long chain omega-6, adrenic acid is another omega-6 that's actively accumulated in the developing brain. Uh, you get it primarily from uh, poultry, pork, and, and, and eggs. And then at almost double the rate, you also get an increase in oleic acid, the main uh, monounsaturated fats uh, from, from animal foods. So it's basically, in order to build a brain, you need a lot of polyunsaturated fatty acids and uh, monounsaturates. Um, what's interesting then, um, and this kind of goes back to what Tucker was just talking about, was 
that if you increase the amount of linoleic acid that's around, you actively compete for uptake of DHA into the brain, DHA being one of the critical factors of, of uh, neuronal function. So this is a study done in piglets. Piglets actually are a really nice model for both gut and brain development uh, relative to humans. Um, and they had piglets fed regular sour milk or a formula where they doubled the amount of linoleic acid and actually slightly increased the alpha linoleic acid, that's the omega-3 precursor. Um, but what you see down here, um, the black bars is after the formula, and you see basically a progressive decrease in the amount of DHA in the brain after doubling the amount of linoleic acid uh, that was present. Um, so then, if you look at something like breast milk, um, and Kevin warned me not to talk about breastfeeding, but I just talk about breast milk. Um, and if you look at breast milk uh, in the last you know, several decades, the linoleic acid content has increased you know, at least threefold. Um, and then this is, again, alpha linoleic acid has stayed about the same. Um, and the, the fat content of breast milk comes about two thirds from body fat, uh, fat that's previously stored, and about a third from, from dietary fat. So this is uh, purely based on uh, the amount of linoleic acid that's increasing in the diet. And my main concern is that this is then actively competing for DHA uptake in the brain, sort of on a population level. Here's an example of this. So that's one, this is one baby from, from that previous study I showed where instead of getting breast milk, I got a formula that had a very high ratio of linoleic acid uh, to omega-3s. Omega and this is the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 in the brain. You see it's completely different, you know, very, very low um, relative to, to normal, normal uptake. So you can actually measure this, um, measure this in, in the brain when they've had the opportunity to do so. Um, low DHA itself is associated with increased risk of preterm birth, and pretty much the only thing that's been shown uh, where omega, active omega-3 supplementation in randomized controlled trials is almost definitely positive is in preventing preterm birth in those who are at risk. Uh, we also know that if you have uh, lower DHA at birth, you have a higher risk of bleeding into your brain, which is associated with both death and the neurodevelopmental impairment. Um, what's interesting then is when you look at uh, trials of DHA, uh, or arachidonic uh, supplementation in, in both term and preterm babies, you don't really see much benefit. It depends a little bit on the, the dose and timing and all that kind of stuff. But the reason why I've included this meta-analysis particularly is because they included the average linoleic acid used in the formula, 17.4%. And I think at that point, basically any DHA you're, ge you're getting is never going to make its way into the brain. Um, so then if we try and translate that into cognitive decline, uh, there's extensive evidence that DHA and EPA, long-chain omega-3s, and their intake uh, is associated with decreased dementia risk. Uh, but again, there's minif minimal benefit in randomized controlled trials. Uh, and actually, if you look at the DHA in the brain of patients with dementia, it's not reliably lower. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. Um, but we do know, and this is the study that, that Tucker just referenced, that if you, um, if you look for OXLAMs, oxidized linoleic acid metabolites, in Alzheimer's patients, they're elevated. You can decrease this by decreasing dietary linoleic acid intake. And we also know from some rodent studies that if you give OXLAMs in the diet, they can also decrease um, omega-3 uh, levels in the brain, even though they're you know, not full fats. Um, the next important thing, just to kind of tie this story together, there's an unknown modulating fat of the adipose tissue, which is a really important buffer for DHA. Um, and we know that DHA is actively released by the maternal adipose stores to be given to the baby. Um, and it's also uh, stored in the neonatal adipose tissue to su supply the brain as the brain is growing. This is um, a figure from a paper that we just submitted. Um, and basically, the whole reason I include it is because right now there's this big drive to take fancy DHA supplements as, as, as phospholipid form. Uh, but actually, if you look at uh, the studies where they then gave the form for more than three days, all of it evens out. So yes, if you give it acutely one dose, you're more likely to get a phospholipid form like a krill oil into the brain. But actually, the adipose tissue takes up triglyceride forms, and then it just doses it out to the brain as it needs. Um, so you don't need to take a fancy form, although ideally you would just eat, eat fish. Um, the final part of this story then is that you need other things for omega-3s to be useful. And this is data from um, the Vitacog study uh, done at Oxford where they gave uh, various B vitamins, so this was actually uh, uh, B6, folate, and B12, to reduce brain atrophy in people with mild cognitive impairment. And they saw they, you only saw benefit, you only saw a decrease in the rate of brain atrophy in those who had uh, higher levels of uh, omega-3. So all of these things uh, interact. So to kind of uh, summarize that, I think ketones are interesting, but probably for reasons other than why we usually talk about them, the very important metabolic precursors.
DHA is critical for brain uh, growth and repair. Uh, in, in my mind, it's perhaps the strongest case providing hyaluronic acid intakes, particularly uh, in, in development. Um, and long-term intake is probably more important than supplementation. And then, you know, to go back to Diana's talk yesterday, you know, the too long didn't read, like, growing brains, kids, they need animal foods. Uh, really, really critical. You can do whatever you want when you're an adult, but don't do it to your kids. Um, so the, the, the middle thing that I'm going to talk about is security. Um, and there's many, many things that go into this in terms of toxic exposures and all that kind of stuff. But I'm going to talk mainly about glucose and muscle mass. So again, if we go back to babies born prematurely, if you look at their risk of uh, insulin resistance and associated syndromes, you see that babies born early preterm and then late preterm are dose, sort of dose dependently have an increased risk of high blood pressure, obesity, uh, metabolic syndrome, and uh, fatty liver syndrome. And this is just like the first, like I've said, this is kind of the first chance we get to see it, but it seems like the more preterm you are, the more likely you are to be insulin resistant. Um, then translating uh, to cognitive decline, we know that if you're pre-diabetic, not you don't have to be frankly diabetic, if you're pre-diabetic, you have about a 70% at least increased risk of having some kind of uh, dementia. Similarly, if we then look at the age of your brain, this is, a, this is a similar data to what I showed you earlier. In patients with diabetes, if you look at those in the top 25% of fasting blood sugar versus the bottom 25%, you have a big difference in terms of how old their brain looks. So higher blood sugar, uh, particularly persistently, seems to be directly involved in the aging of the brain. And one of uh, perhaps even a better uh, predictor than of, uh, of, of this than uh, fasting blood sugar is dynamic changes in blood sugar. So this is nice data from a, a Japanese trial where they gave dipeptidyl peptidase four inhibitors, which actually decreased the metabolism of incretin. So I'm, I'm ticking off all the different um, uh, talks that I'm, I'm referring to. But, but basically, and that includes blood sugar control. Um, at the beginning of the two-year study, they looked at mean amplitude of glycemic excursions. So how big are the glycemic excursions? Um, and the bigger the excursions in an individual, uh, the worse their cognitive function. And the bigger the improvement in their glycemic excursions, the bigger the reduction, the better their improvement in cognitive function. So you can actively reverse this process over time. That's the important thing, right? This isn't a fixed problem. Um, one thing that's very interesting if we're talking about glycemic um, excursions is that uh, what we know now is that basically from a food, you cannot tell how an individual will respond. So this is uh, data from one study where they looked at uh, uh, the, trying to predict uh, the glucose area under the curve after a meal. And uh, better than just looking at the carbohydrates in the meal was looking at an individual's long-term uh, blood sugar control with HbA1c. So uh, just looking at carbs in a meal, just looking at the quote-unquote glycemic index will probably tell you nothing, um, and you need to t take some more, some, some more, some more accurate measures. Um, this is important if you want to live a long time uh, as well, because uh, this is data from the Baltimore uh, Aging and Lo uh, Longevity Study. And what they've done is an oral glucose tolerance test in people uh, by decade. And what you'll see that as the decades go up, um, the, the glucose peak goes up and up and up until a spike at 60 to 69. And then it's slightly better in the 70-year-olds 70, 70 and then slightly better again, 80-year-olds. And my main takeaway from this is that if you want to make it to be 70 or 80 so you can even be included in the study because you're still alive, you need to have better <laughs> blood sugar control. Um, which then brings me on to muscle tissue. And your muscle tissue is basically your best buffer for circulating blood glucose. Um, this is a nice study where uh, they could look at, the, where they took um, people and they trained just one of their legs for 10 weeks. And then they looked at the effects of acute training, detraining. Um, and what you see, so this, they did a, an insulin uh, clamp to look at glucose uptake, which is not really physiological. But you see even a baseline, in a, in a trained leg versus the untrained leg, you have two to three times glu uh, the glucose uptake per kilo of muscle tissue. So the more muscle you have and the more active it is, the more glucose uptake you get. Um, and this kind of you know, ties up multiple different things that basically say muscle does everything that you need to do in order to reverse or prevent the process of aging. So not only is uh, muscle and the movement of muscle um, actively uh, anti-inflammatory and has benefits of glucose uptake and um, you know, hormetic stress improving uh, 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 resistance to re reactive oxygen species, but being sedentary is also the direct opposite. It is um, directly pro-inflammatory. Uh, so um, you see similar things, again, if you're trying to grow a brain, particularly one that's at risk. So if we look at babies born prematurely, 
increased uh, free fat, uh, fat free mass secretion, so that's basically increased um, muscle mass gain, and so um, is associated with improved processing speed, imp improved processing performance, uh, decreased risk of any type of neurodevelopmental impairment, and, and higher IQ. Uh, and particularly, the, this, this one study, so that's a summary of several studies, but this one study, just looking at preterms, particularly over four years, the more muscle mass they gained, that was associated with a, a, an increased um, I IQ and, and processing speed. Um, and we see the same again uh, in patients uh, with cognitive decline. Uh, so here, this is a study where they looked at uh, mus where they looked at different uh, uh, type parts of the body composition and uh, total volume of uh, or the amount of brain matter that somebody has after adjusting for like the size of their skull, which is obviously different from person to person. And you see things like uh, BMI wasn't really predicted. Uh, predictive fat mass wasn't predictive, but lean mass was uh, significantly associated with the amount of brain that you have. So the more muscle you have, the more brain you have. Um, here, this is data from the UK Biobank study where they looked at uh, lean mass, uh, muscle tissue, and a uh, marker of fluid intelligence. And you see, actually, it seems to be uh, more predictive in females than in males, but um, essentially, and lots of variability, as you'd expect, but a, po a positive linear correlation between the amount of muscle mass you have and fluid intelligence. Um, we know that exercise is neurotrophic, which probably plays a big part of this. The first time that we saw in a clinical study that you could actually increase the size of the hippocampus in somebody um, who was older in their 60s include uh, a study where they did uh, walking for 40 minutes three times a week, and that significantly increased the size of the hippocampus on MRI. Um, and the, the greater the improvement um, in uh, uh, cardiovascular fitness, the, the, the bigger your uh, hippocampus got, and the same thing, that, and that seems to be tied to BDNF production. So then you probably want to know how much uh, is enough muscle, and there was um, a study that used the, the NHANES data that said that you need to be on about the top 50% of the population to have sort of the highest um, or, or, or the best uh, longevity um, compared to the lower 50%. The lower uh, but that's not particularly useful because you might know from epidemiology studies, they say this is the top 50%, but they don't tell you what amount of muscle those people actually had. So these are analyses that I did uh, with that same data. Um, and this uses the, the uh, fat-free mass index, FFMI, which is basically your BMI after you've taken away body fat. Um, and so for women, um, you, the confidence intervals cross uh, zero. So here, risk increases, mortality risk increases as FFMI goes below 14. And for men, it's 17. But ideally, you probably want to be closer to uh, like 17 and, and 21, it seems like. And that's not that much. That's the important, the important takeaway is it's, you know, it's, again, it's somewhere near the top 50% of the population. This is definitely achievable by anybody. If we then look at um, the additional uh, benefit of that on mortality, so this um, using uh, biological age uh, derived from various blood test markers and adjusting for sex and body fat percentage, I looked at how much does each kilo of muscle reduce your risk of mortality? It's about 7%. Um, and then for each one you add to your FFMI above those, those limits I showed earlier, 14 or 17. Uh, so this is, on, for the average person, it's maybe 8 to 10 pounds of muscle. You get a 22% reduction in mortality risk. Uh, so uh, to summarize that part, uh, more bigger, more brainier. Um, your, uh, your muscle mass is a critical organ both as a gluto glucose sink, anti-inflammatory, neurotrophic, but it requires physical movement. Um, and if you aim to be in the top third to 50% of muscle mass uh, or strength, uh, it's associated with significantly improved uh, longevity and probably uh, and brain volume and brain health as well. So the final thing that I'm going to talk about um, is connection, and particularly connection to the physical world around you. Um, so somebody uh, previously in, in the conference mentioned uh, the phrase, use it or lose it. And it's interesting because if you look at the age that pe where people retire, it seems that even after you adjust for things like medical conditions and other things that would make you retire earlier, the earlier you retire, the earlier you die. Um, and um, there may be several uh, biological reasons for that. So if we think about trying to build and develop a brain in the first place, we should think about what does it take uh, in terms of nervous system demands to do that? So this is a, um, this is an, a graph I've made arbitrary units of nervous system demands. 
um, to kind of to kind of showcase this. And, and a lot of this stuff and the, the, the slides coming up are from a close friend and colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Josh Turknett, who's a board certified neurologist, and you'll see his name pop up a few times. Um, but basically, if you're trying to learn to walk, learn to talk, you're trying to learn social interaction, these are incredibly difficult tasks that require a huge amount of, of, of neurological um, and motor effort. Um, and so you start with this in your first few years of life, and then you, know, you learn to drive, um, and you know, that's still difficult, but it's probably less difficult than learning how to walk in the first place. Um, and then you, know, you go, go to, to school and you learn biochemistry, and you know, learning the Krebs cycle, even though it's difficult, it's not as hard as learning how to like, socially interact with other people. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, then you go, and then you go to work, um, and then you retire, and then you think, well, I should do some Sudoku because I'm not using my brain. Um, and I'd probably add you know, arbitrary random online brain training here as well because it just doesn't require the same demands as, as some of these other things. So, so like the summary of that is that there's a massive discrepancy be be between what you do early in life to develop and wire your brain um, versus what you do later in life in terms of the demands that you then put on your brain. Um, and there are some other ways that we, we know we can grow our brain matter. So this is a super interesting study where they looked at uh, taxi drivers in central London. To be a t to traditionally, to be a taxi driver in central London, you had to learn the knowledge, which is basically this entire map of six miles, around, uh, six miles circumference around, uh, radius around Charing Cross Station. So you basically should be able to get anywhere in this area in London without looking at a map. Um, and when they looked at the brains of people who, who uh, passed the exam, they actually had an increase in gray matter on the MRI. Those who failed didn't get that increase. Um, and then controls also just, just stay the same. So actively challenging your brain. I mean, this is really difficult. As you can surprise to learn that, you know, ha has this benefit on the brain. Um, and and so, so similarly, uh, it's important that what you're doing is actually a significant challenge. So this is, again, this is a study where they looked at all the different times they looked at this brain age metric. This is this MRI metric looking at how old your brain is. Professional musicians, so these are people on average in their 20s. Professional musicians have a, have a lower brain age, but amateur musicians have a significantly um, greater benefit. And it's because they're bad at it. So... <laughs> You're, you're, you're playing your mu musical instrument, but it's hard. Um, and, and, and once you get good at it, you don't get the same benefit. Um, and, and so because Aaron's here, I, 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 I thought I'd talk about bird brains. Uh, wait, I mean, because Aaron's here, I'm going to talk about the brains of birds. Um, and <laughs> these are... Uh, these are a, a series of experiments that were done by Eric uh, Knudsen at, uh, in Stanford. Um, and what they did is they, they put on bowel owls, they put these prisms that shift, uh, shift vision. Um, and what it does is it causes a mismatch in the superior colliculus, which is what maps sensory inputs into like physical space. Um, and what they saw is that juvenile uh, owls rapidly rewire. So you put the prism on and they can really quickly figure out um, uh, where they are in space. Um, adults adult owls uh, don't do that. Uh, however, if you make the increment smaller or you force them to do something like it, they really need to be able to rewire, so they did this with hunting, then you actually see uh, a greater improvement. And so th this, is, this is some just showing that. So here, this is the interaural timing difference. So that's basically a measure of uh, the map shift in the brain. And so if you don't make the adults hunt, they don't get much of a shift. But if you do make them hunt, they do. And then that improves their accuracy in actual hunting. And so the, the reason why you know, this is necessity, if you want to eat, you have to be able to, to, to figure this out. And so uh, this has been kind of, these studies have been slightly misconstrued um, uh, recently as being like directly relevant to humans. So, so, uh, but what's interesting is that PRISM studies have been done in humans since basically the, the late 18, 1890s. Uh, they were first done uh, in Berkeley. And then uh, a lot of it was done later in Innsbruck with the Innsbruck goggle experiments. And so there's some evidence that older adults adapt more slowly, similar to the owls. But I don't think it's relevant over important timescales. And it's probably driven by necessity and interaction with the environment. So actually physically going out there and experiencing the environment. So this is one study where they, they uh, uh, used prisms to shift the visual field. And then you had to like throw balls to hit a target. And uh, older adults, these are people in their 60s, they took more throws to like 
hit end up hitting the target. And then when you took the prism off, it took them longer for them to like figure out like back to back to normal. However, this is I don't think this is necessarily that relevant to real life. Uh, you know, like you like this difference, you're still adapting within you know a short period of time. Um, this is a is a, a, a quote from um, some of the Innsbruck goggle experiments where they completely flipped somebody's vision and then forced them to use that all the time. And so they say, between the first and third day, the world was upside down to the participant. There were many mistakes in grabbing objects and moving. By the fifth day, things, had been, things that had been seen upside down suddenly were upright once the participant brought their, brought their hands into the picture. From the sixth day of, un, of uninterruptedly wearing reversing spectacles, permanent upright vision ensued and behavior was perfectly correct. So basically, within six days, the adult brain can completely rewire where where it is um, in physical space. Isn't that cool? Um, and so I think this is important because uh, challenges to um, the vestibular system to your position in space probably have a greater um, existential threat or associated with a greater existential threat, so they are a greater drive for plasticity. Um, and so you see here, this is, um, this is a study where they, they uh, took older adults and they either put them in dance or sport. This is like a circuit training. And in the dance group, they saw a greater um, increase in, in the size of the hippocampus on MRI. This is a recent meta-analysis where they looked at different types of exercise and effect on co cognitive function. And actually, only coordinative exercise, so yoga, Zumba, dancing, actually significantly improve cognitive function. So, if, so challenging the, the motor uh, vestibular system, challenging your balance, seems to be really important for, for cognitive function. Um, so I'm just wrapping up now. Uh, this again goes back to preterm births to kind of support that. But if you look at babies, if you look at adults born preterm, those who had better executive function were the ones who had better motor skills rather than ones who had better uh, cardiovascular fitness. Um, so these are the forces hastening your neurobiological demise. Uh, all scripted learning childhood, uh, char all scripted learning is in childhood, and then basically you go to work, you do the same thing again and again and again, and then you never challenge uh, your, your neurological system. And adults also don't like doing stuff that they suck at, but you should. Um, and so I, I did want to quickly bring up something that came up in, in Dale's talk, which is that he said that in dementia, um, uh, demand exceeds supply as the brain can no longer maintain itself. But I would argue that it's the, that it's the other way around. So you reduce demand on the brain, and then the, the brain's like, well, I don't really need to be here, so I'm just going to slowly pair myself back and saving energy. Um, and we do know that neurons have a self-destruct mechanism. It was discovered about 10 years ago. So if you reduce or uh, get rid of the connection to a neuron, it's just going like, to kill itself because it's like, well, I'm not, I'm not useful anymore. Um, and if we relate this back to muscle mass, we know that the first rule of building muscle is progressive overload. You challenge the system as it, as it adapts, you challenge it more. Um, and then, obviously, sleep and recovery is super important here, but I didn't get a chance to, to talk about that. So this is basically the idea is that as we reduce demand, we reduce repair, repair it increases biological degradation, decreases capacity in a, in a feed-forward loop. Instead, if we increase demands, then we can reverse that whole process. Um, so. What does a brain need? Uh, in summary, I think we should do as the babies do, challenge yourself continuously, do things you're bad at, eat fish and animal-derived nutrients, move and accrue and keep as much muscle mass as you physically can, uh, and don't have a mixed, fixed mindset about having a fixed mind. Your mind is actually much more plastic and flexible than you, than you have been told that it is. Thank you very much. So we have some time for questions. Hey, Tommy. Great talk. Thanks. So I'm very interested in what you were talking about with the oxalams, uh, oxidized linoleic acid metabolites, right? Yeah. Now, this were you talking about them in the context, like the testing, were these from uh, biopsies, like they were intracellular? So um, there's, there was two different sets of studies. So in, in Alzheimer's disease patients, it's just circulating ox oxalams. But in rodent studies, if you increase linoleic acid content, that increases linoleic acid in the brain, which then turns into oxalams. If you just feed oxalams themselves to rats, it doesn't end up in the brain, but it does de still decrease the amount of DHA that's in the brain. So it can have, so there's two potential. So linoleic acid may directly compete in some way, but then also its breakdown products may also reduce DHA in the brain. I'm not used to an unmodified metabolite competing with an oxidized metabolite. What's the receptor involved? Or do you, do you know that? I don't offhand? know. Okay. Interesting. Go to that side. <laughs> uh, thank you, Tommy. Um, 
regarding the particular skills uh, or or brain function that you might be able to gain uh, by picking up a new skill, um, I'm curious as to you know the the uh, cross effects of uh, so let's say that you know you decide to challenge your brain one day by playing the flute, which you've never done before. Does that translate into necessarily like you know skills in other areas like let's say would it would it make you a better driver for example so, so i don't i don't think so but the the process so if, if you think about now the the neurotransmitters and the parts of the brain involved in that process so if you are if you're not if you're actively trying to learn the flute rather than just blowing on it and realizing you can't play it but if you're actively trying to learn it then the some of the things that you need like you will activate the sympathetic nervous system because you're frustrated by your failure and that will create some of the uh, sort of things required for plasticity so doing that you could then apply it to something in the you know immediately afterwards and and see benefit in terms of learning that skill as well but like just learning one skill won't necessarily make you better at another does that make sense yes yes thank you hi tommy great talk uh Real quick before my question, I think the mechanism with the uh, Oxlams is the uh, lipid peroxidation products impair the delta-6 desaturase enzyme. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, they've shown that by feeding heated oils to rats. Yeah. Um, so my question is, if I wasn't misinterpreting the graph of fat-free mass index, it looked mm -hmm. like a U-shaped curve where you didn't want to be in the top 50%, you wanted to be at the 50%. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, so if you're in the top 50%, actually it looks identical to um, the, the second quartile in terms, of the, in terms of this other paper that came out that uh, didn't show the, the actual amount of muscle mass. The interesting thing, and it's particularly because of the NHANES data set, it's an average US population, the muscle mass is directly correlated to fat mass. So basically the people who have, so uh, there's, there's uh, interacting and confounding factors there that you, be, oh, I be, see. So because they're linearly correlated, you can't fully adjust for that. So you think if, if you were able to create like a, uh, some index that included leanness, yes, then you think that just being well, the top 50% would, it wouldn't be a U shape. It's not an index of leanness. It's if that data were a, you or know, if you were, limited were it to lean people. Yeah. So yeah, you say that, um, if you look at, so, so I try to look for somebody who has my body composition and NHANES doesn't exist. So I, there's not even one data point that I could use. So I, so I don't even know on a population level what body composition is best because that data doesn't exist. But you suspect in a hypothetical uh, population of lean people that yes. fat-free mass index would not be U-shaped? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Hi, Tommy. Great talk as always. Uh, can you tell me, is the brain training part being put into practice anywhere? So, for example, are you talking to Dale? I interviewed Deborah Gordon recently, and she's a co-author on the new precision medicine um, approach to reversing Alzheimer's. And it looks great, but I noticed they're still taking the Lumosity, Sudoku-type approach to brain training. I think you've got something far more compelling here. Yeah, so they, so they use Brain HQ, which does have... Um, which, and the reason they use it is because there's scientific evidence to support it. It does sh show benefit. Um, I guess my main argument is that there's only so, you know, it's, it's not a relevant skill in the real world. Uh, so I'm sure there is benefit because you're creating a neurological stimulus. But I would argue that getting somebody to do, to, to do yoga or slacklining or something like that will, will give a much bigger stimulus. Mm -hmm. So I know why they're using what they're using. There is definitely benefit. It's you know, scientifically validated. But I think there are other things that would provide a, a better and more important mm -hmm. stimulus. So if you could publish data on this, then maybe they employ health coaches to teach people how to do this rather than just giving the money to some you know, software thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. I'm so excited that you and Josh are collaborating on this subject. Um, his, uh, the, you know, the demand-driven theory of cognitive decline was like my, like, favorite thing of uh, the last uh, physicians conference that I was at. And um, I, what I especially like about it um, was the suggestion that teaching might uh, uh, very um, address the the multi-generational energy management uh, concept that 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 teaching might provide uh, cognitive demand load somewhat um, along with learning that, that um, across generations is going to be part of our energy management system. So uh, I didn't see you mention teaching in here, and I just wondered if you could speak to that uh, aspect. So I think I, I may have skipped over it, or maybe I took it out. There is, um, 
I did have a slide where, where teaching was given as, a, as an example of a neurological stimulus that provides the same and kind of supports some of the aspects of the grandmother hypothesis, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, and there is some anecdotal data, again, from long-lived populations who live a long time without a cognitive decline that like those who have good cognitive faculties late into life have some kind of teaching role uh, in society. It's, it's anecdotal, but absolutely, mm -hmm. I think teaching is very important. Yeah, you had the, the arbitrary units of um, uh, cognitive demand, and I was just curious like, if you have a sense of where they stack up. Oh, no, it, they're arbitrary for a reason. Well, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is it, like, do you think that teaching is somewhere like on the same level so, as learning or like ish? Yeah. So, I mean, my guess is no. My guess is that adults will really struggle to do anything that's as difficult as learning how to manipulate a, a flesh sack in, in 3D space. <laughs> um, but but I, but I think you can definitely get enough of a stimulus in order to in order to, to get the maximal potential benefit. Ah. Oh, nice. Last point. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Okay, we have six minutes for our break, so let's thank Tommy right. Woods again. And don't go far, we have our last trippy talk coming up very soon. <laughs>